an enlightening report on the state of religious persecution, and the five places you don't want to live if you're a Christian. All that's coming up on today's Hot Zone. This is the Hot Zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. Hey folks, as you watch this, I'm en route to Africa and I'll try to report next week while I'm in Nigeria, but if for some reason I can't get a podcast out while I'm there, I've got some great backup content loaded up for you, so don't despair. It'd really mean a lot to me if you'd share this podcast with your friends and put some skin in the game by subscribing over at patreon.com slash hot zone. That's patreon.com slash hot zone. I mean, people subscribe to magazines and newspapers, and so why not subscribe to the podcast? All right, let's talk about persecution. Uh, an independent report into the persecution of Christians commissioned by the British government says persecution's on the rise and that Christians are the group most persecuted for their religion anywhere in the world. The report's publication in London was marked in Rome on Monday by a meeting organized by the British Embassy to the Holy See in the Basilica of St. Bartholomew, which is devoted to modern-day Christian martyrs. That's at the Vatican, if you missed that part. <clears throat> anyway, details of the report were written by the Bishop of Truro, uh, the Right Reverend Philip Mount Stephen, and were summarized by Sally Axworthy, the British Ambassador to the Holy See. She said the report commissioned by British Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt looked at the plight of persecuted Christians around the world, concluding that a variety of factors were behind the anti-Christian oppression, including aggressive nationalism and a rise of Islamic extremism. I don't think anybody's surprised by that. The report also assesses the quality of British Foreign Office's response to such persecution, which according to the report affects 245 million people and looks at how the international community can support persecuted Christians better. The report recommends that Britain push for a UN Security Council resolution urging governments in the Middle East and North Africa to protect Christians and other persecuted minorities. So let's listen to some of that meeting. I think that today's initiative has a great value to unveil the stories of so many Christians in the world persecuted in our times. As Pope Francis said, visiting this basilica the living legacy of martyrs gives us peace and unity today. They teach us that with the power of love, with weakness, one can fight against arrogance, violence, and war, and one can bring about peace with patience. The persecution of Christians is something that happens mainly in the global south and to the global poor. So that's the first point. Um, he, he says that persecution of Christians is a global phenomenon. It happens everywhere. And therefore, he thinks it's worth, it merits being looked at. And his third major reason is that the treatment of Christian minorities is a bellwether for how all minorities are treated. So if Christians suffer, uh, that usually goes together with um, the abuse of human rights more generally. And he also says that Christians... Uh, tend to speak truth to power, which can make them a particular focus of persecution. But he makes very clear that freedom of religion and belief the universal human right is for all, for everyone, as he says, without fear or favor. And he mentions the major abuses of uh, people who've suffered for their religion, for other religions, such as the Rohingya in Myanmar, the Yazidis in Iraq, and the Uyghur Muslims in China. Um, he also recognizes that in the past, and to some extent the present, Christians have been responsible for perpetrating persecution themselves. In the absence of a standard definition, he's defined it as discriminatory treatment accompanied by threats of violence. Um, and he says that the types of persecution vary enormously. So ranging from the bombing of churches, uh, to in, in, for example, in Egypt and India, to the kidnapping of Christian girls in Pakistan and Nigeria, uh, to the prevention of freedom of worship in Saudi Arabia and the Maldives, or misuse of the blasphemy laws in Pakistan. So everything from violence and murder to discrimination and exclusion. Um, he, he points out that uh, 
persecution often correlates to social exclusion, and that in Pakistan, for example, the Christian minority is also uh, economically marginalised. He says persecution is on the rise, and that Christians are the group most persecuted for their religion in the world. He says 80% of persecuted believers are Christians. Um, and in 2016, Christians were targeted in 144 countries. And he reports that Open Doors, which is an NGO who worked with the, with the bishop on this report, um, estimates that anti-Christian oppression affects 245 million people. And the, um, the causes, I think, as he draws out in the report, um, are partly aggressive nationalism, partly a rise of Islamist extremism, and partly people, Christians being ter per persecuted for speaking the truth and therefore being targeted by organized crime uh, and by criminal groups. Now, during that, uh, the Cardinal Malcolm uh, Ranjith, which is, uh, he's the Archbishop of Colombo, that's in Sri Lanka, he spoke at, uh, at that meeting and uh, about, talked about the victims of the 2019 Easter Sri Lankan bombings. This disaster could have been prevented because if I knew, by any chance, if I knew that there was an attack planned, I would have closed the churches and told the people to go home and we could have protected all these people. It is serious lapse of responsibility on the part of the government of Sri Lanka. During a presentation of Catholic aid organizations, worldwide persecuted Christians breakout session. The Aid to the Church in Need organization, ACN, highlighted the support it provided to the Indian Ocean Nation, among other countries, following the suicide bomb attacks on three churches and three tourist hotels that killed at least 250 people and injured about 500 others. It was really bad. At one point during the news conference, the archbishop paused and kind of fought back tears after he recounted a story of a father who lost his wife and three children in the attacks. Speaking in Italian here, he says, for example, there's a husband who lost his wife and three children. When I went to visit him, he told me that before, when he would come home from work, three children ran to him, and now there's no one, only an empty house. And that's when the archbishop sort of lost it. Who can blame him? All right, now I want to play for you my list of the top five places you don't want to live if you're a Christian. Now, let's talk about religious persecution. Unfortunately, we're seeing it spread all around the world. And in the last week, I've come up with a top five list of the places you don't want to live if you're a Christian. Number five, Burma. The Burmese military junta has been killing up to 10,000 Christians a year for decades. The Hill Tribes people who live in Burma, also called Myanmar, were converted to Christianity about 100 years ago by Adoniram Judson, actually over 100 years ago. The first white missionary to preach in Burma back in the mid-19th century was Adoniram Judson. But the government of Burma is now Buddhist, and they make no bones about the fact that they plan to drive every Christian out of their country. Number four, Iran. Last week, the Iranians began a crackdown on Iranian Christians and rounded up more than 100 of them. Converting to Christianity is a crime there, and proselytizing can get you 10 years in prison. This is common in many countries across the Middle East, and surprisingly, there's a growing trend of people converting anyway. Number three, China. About 100 worshipers were snatched from their homes in coordinated raids last week. They were members of an unauthorized home church. While the Christian church is not officially banned in China, freedom of worship is non-existent. And with the Chinese government's new push to use technology to monitor every detail of their citizens' lives and then assign them a social score based on their behavior, even those Christians who aren't arrested could find themselves unable to travel or get loans or jobs or maybe even go shopping. Extrapolate this out a bit and you can kind of see how Christian end times prophecy could definitely come true. Number two is Nigeria. Human rights groups are reporting that upwards of 60,000 Christians have been killed in that country since 2001. Near daily violent attacks by the ISIS-affiliated Boko Haram organization, as well as hostile Fulani tribesmen, have killed thousands and have driven up to 2.5 million Nigerians from their homes. Boko Haram burns churches, they close schools, and they kidnap women and children and then force them into forced marriages. 
that country is a serious mess and is about as close to a failed state as a country can get without being Somalia. Number one worst place to be a Christian this week, Afghanistan. There's only one actual Christian building in the entire country, which is the, the Christian chapel at the Italian embassy. No Afghans are allowed inside. Afghan citizens are legally prohibited from converting to Christianity, and the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan does not recognize any Afghan citizen as being Christian, though I happen to be friends with a Christian missionary there who believes there are may be perhaps a thousand Afghans who follow Christ and live secretly around the country. Being exposed as a believer in Afghanistan is a quicker way to die than walking through Earp, Texas, carrying a sign that says, I'm here to take your guns. Now, when I say these places, these are places that a Christian wouldn't want to live, I'm being a little bit facetious because Christians aren't called to be safe and comfortable. And in many ways, living in a place where you're free to practice your faith also means you're free to do anything but practice it. If you're a Christian in Burma or Nigeria or Iran, you have to commit. And I, I could tell you some amazing stories of believers that I've met in some of those countries whose faith is so strong, I actually en envy them for what they, they live through. So about three weeks ago, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo gave a kind of a report on the report that was put out on religious persecution, kind of stating the stance of the State Department to, as it pertains to religious persecution around the globe. And I want to play some of that speech right now because he has some very salient points in there that you need to hear. Here goes. So today I'm pleased to announce that here at the State Department, we're elevating the Office of International Religious Freedom along with the Office of the Special Envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism within our organization. Effective immediately, each of these two offices will report directly to the Undersecretary for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights. This reorganization will provide these offices with additional staff and resources and enhance partnerships both within our agency, within our agency and without. It will empower them to better carry out their important mandates. Second, I'm pleased to announce the, religious, the release of the religious, International Religious Freedom Report for 2018. Uh, it's like a report card. It tracks countries to see how well they've respected this fundamental human right. And in Turkey, at President Trump's urging, they released Pastor Andrew Brunson, who had been wrongfully imprisoned on account of his faith. We continue to seek the release of our locally employed staff there. In addition, we urge the immediate reopening of the Halki Seminary near Istanbul. Look, we welcome all of these glimmers of progress, but demand much more. 2018, unfortunately, was far from perfect. As in previous years, our report exposes a chilling array of abuses committed by oppressive regimes, violent extremist groups, and individual citizens. For all those that run roughshod over religious freedom, I'll say this. The United States is watching, and you will be held to account. In Iran, the regime's crackdown on the Baha'is, Christians, and others continues to shock the conscience. In Russia, Jehovah's Witnesses were absurdly and abhorrently branded as terrorists as authorities confiscated their property and then threatened their families. In Burma, Burma, Rohingya Muslims continue to face violence at the hands of the military. Hundreds of thousands have fled or been forced to live in overcrowded refugee camps. And in China, the government's intense persecution of many faiths, Falun Gong practitioners, Christians, and Tibetan Buddhists among them is the norm. The Chinese Communist Party has exhibited extreme hostility to all religious faiths since its founding. The party demands that it alone be called God. Finally, I'll just mention one more reason this report matters so much. It will inspire conversations leading up to our second annual ministerial to advance religious freedom that I'll be hosting here in mid-July. This year, we'll welcome up to 1,000 individuals who will renew their zeal for the mission of religious freedom and I'm proud to be one of them. I'm crossing the days off my calendar waiting for this. Can you say Thank you all. Today? Well, that's it for today, folks. Thanks for watching. Hope you'll have a great weekend, and I'll see you back on Monday right here on The Hot Zone. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2019.